It's on. Yeah. It's solid now. So we can wait just like another minute or so for any last minute people. It's a hard one. Pretty difficult. You be careful. Perfect. I don't know. Should we start? So Jacob, is that is it on? Are we good? We could probably begin. I mean, if we finish early, that's better for you guys, right? I don't know. It should be enough to cover the full three hours, and then we'll take a break. Um, so I have. I guess I can introduce myself. So my name is Derek Hollenbeck. I'm one of Dr. Chen's uh, graduate students. Um, in mechanical engineering, so he asked me today to come in and give a guest lecture on three topics, or actually a multitude of topics. One's going to be on communication systems, and then we'll talk a little bit about long-range uh, drones, and then UTM, beyond visual line of sight, and also a little bit on swarms. Um, so there's sort of three slide decks, since it is sort of long, we'll find a good spot to pause probably in the second deck for the first break and then after the second deck we'll probably pause again because it's a little bit longer and then should be done after the third one. I'm actually going to switch over because I have some introductory slides on another uh, set here to give you a little bit of a background on myself. So started off at a community college um, where I got an associates in math and physical science, transferred down to the junior college over here, and then started getting my sort of undergraduate like prerequisites to uh, transfer to UC Merced. And then I got a bachelor's in 2016, mechanical engineering, and then now I'm in the PhD program. Uh, which I almost went to the East Coast to do aerospace engineering, so Dr. Chen has talked me into staying. So, I mean, a little bit of background on me. Before I started the lab, I did Design Build Fly, so I, um, which is an international design competition. Uh, first year was in Tucson, Arizona. And then we competed again in the 2015-16 year. Um, uh, 
where we uh, competed in, in Wichita, Kansas, and then also I've competed in uh, the NASA's Distributed Electric Propulsion Competition. And so, so these pictures right here, this is from the 2015-16 year. So we had to create two aircraft. Um, one actually will disassemble and go inside the other one. Uh, it was very windy and rainy and actually had like a tornado warning while we were there. And then in Arizona, this is the first year we did it. Uh, we only had to create one aircraft. Uh, worked out pretty good uh, before we sort of lawn darted and that was it, it was game over. So this is uh, some pictures of a plane uh, that we designed for the Distributed Electric Propulsion Competition. So it's got 14 engines. It's designed to hold 19 passengers. Uh, it's got two turboelectric generators on the wings that supply power to these electric motors. At least that was the concept. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't win that one. And they didn't give us a placement either, so I don't really know where we're sitting at on, on the competition, but it was definitely interesting to be a part of. So, let's switch over back to the first deck now. So, we can switch to do a sort of an introductory on the UAS communication system. So, Dr. Chen gave you guys some reading assignments. And I know everyone loves to read, right? All right, did you guys get this or is this new? No? No ideas? Okay. So these are both pretty good sources for sort of an introductory background on the communication systems. So the first one is uh, this Unmanned Aircraft Systems Communication by Marshall and others. And then, and then there's one by Austin. Uh, so I'll give you a brief overview. And a lot of this, this slide deck is sort of uh, catered around these two, two uh, literature sources. So, of course, we got a quiz and already went over the outline. So, so in one of, uh, this is in the introductory to UAS systems communications chapter. It goes over a variety, wide variety of things. Uh, so it gives you sort of some basics in the communication. Uh, it goes into modulation a little bit. Uh, the receiver explains you to, to you what signal to noise ratios are. Um, we'll talk a little bit later in a more application sort of point of view on a, on these these topics in more detail. But uh, this source does give you a pretty good uh, idea of what's going on. Um, there's one particularly good part that's if you're doing any sort of design with. Uh, communication systems is the link design section where they talk about the different um, sort of uh, the, the topics up here. So your, your gains, your um, signal to noise ratio, the type of antennas you're using, sort of how to calculate uh, these sort of phase margins or, or not phase margins, um, gain margin that they use to sort of um, understand what the link uh, reliability is. So when you're designing a system and you want to say it to operate within, you know, a mile or two miles, how would you go about designing it? It gives you some pretty good background on that. As well as talking about multipathing, jamming, electromagnetic interference. Um, so this is sort of gives you a conceptual overview of the command link, so you have the RC goes up to the UAV, um, and then it comes back down to your ground control station. Uh, but you can also have a communication going back and forth between your ground control stations, so that's uh, indicated by this double arrow. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what was supposed to be said on this slide. So just for, I guess this first slide deck might be fast because I'm not sure exactly what was supposed to be said on this since I didn't make the slides. So there's this idea of uplink versus downlink. Uplink is where we send telecommands, so we want to control the aircraft, move 
the wings or we want to pitch roll yaw like a, the quad rotor. Um, and then telemetry is sort of giving you back the health of the aircraft, what's going on, you know, battery levels, what is the attitude of the aircraft. Um, signal, um, return signal indicators as well, RSSI, definitely uh, important for your telemetry so you know uh, how healthy your signal is. And then you have on the left is this uh, LOS and, and BLOS, so line of sight and beyond line of sight. Um, I get, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but that's in terms of the communication link, it's just sort of is your antennas within line of sight or are they around, let's say, the curvature of the earth, right? Because depending on sort of frequency, you can get some refraction and you can go a little bit farther than line of sight. So, losses of communication. So this is definitely a very important topic, uh, at least in, in terms of like part 107 or I guess flying in general because no one wants to lose communication. So like one of the first sort of communi communication failures is actually like a hardware failure. So something, one or more sort of pieces fails and then you sort of lose communication. I've actually had this happen to me before, flying a plane, and as soon as I launched the plane, my radio control link just like got broken. It was it might have been cracked already, and it just completely severed, and I had no radio control at all. But luckily, I had fail safes, so it went right into fail safe mode. Started doing loops, and then while I'm sitting here trying to figure out what's going on with my controller, and nothing's working. So then I had to sort of figure out how to bring it down. So luckily the computer was there and I have a communication link as well. So I can, I can use that to sort of guide a, a flight path back down to the ground and then land it. Um, it was easier said than done and I'm thankful I had like tall grass. So the second one is, is line of sight. So it's kind of what I was mentioning on the last slide. Um, so, so if you have line of sight between between uh, you and the other antenna, or you and the drone, and then you fly behind a building, now you don't have line of sight, and the, the radio wave sort of has to go through and penetrate the building, and sometimes it gets attenuated and you lose communication. Uh, so that's never good, so you always sort of want to have line of sight when flying. Uh, so the, the last one is, what is that one? Okay, so the the the, la the the C bullet point is taught is referring to sort of the signal weakening. So if we go too far, you'll get what's called path loss, where it's um, it just sort of um, dampening of the radio wave sort of energy over free space, or it's also called free space loss, and that's sort of in. Uh, something that you have to sort of overcome. There's techniques around it. We'll talk a little more later on that. The last bullet point is sort of jamming. So this would be something I think the military or it might be good for a variety of applications where you maybe you don't want drones in the area, area or you, you do want to sort of um, create secure links. Um, so if your signal link isn't secure, Right, enough, then you might get some sort of someone trying to jam the signal. You can't get communication to your aircraft. You ultimately lose control and you crash. So what do we got? So data rate and bandwidth. Definitely two, two important topics. Um, especially if you're going to design a system. So. Well, one is going to be like, so in terms of whatever sensor or payload you put on this thing, um, the data rate is sort of, is going to be indicative of how you get that sort of down to the ground control station or how do you process the data. Um, so it's measured in bytes per second, but it'll basically, it'll definitely be a design factor if you're going to build something that you need a certain bandwidth or data weight, sorry, data rate. But you also have bandwidth, so that's the amount of sort of spectrum that you're in a question. Uh, it's not really, uh, it is kind of a question. 
but I uh, kind of tie off on the last slide as well. Um, when we used to go to Staten Island, we would fly underneath, like there was a Wi-Fi tower that would be beaming right. Wi-Fi. And every time the drone crossed the stream, it, we would lose connection. Mm. And I was wondering if that Wi-Fi had to be a similar, uh, I guess, the same similar frequency, or even if it was like a way different frequency, if it was like just really, really overpowering. Because what it did is it beamed Wi-Fi across the island. So I'm assuming you're using 2.4. So if you're using 2.4 and that is a, like a traditional Wi-Fi link, it's probably also 2.4. There is techniques, I guess, it's in some later slides, in, in these slides, um, but there's some techniques to, to mitigate that sort of stuff because being a higher frequency and you don't need as much data, you can sort of hop around the frequency, uh, like these, it's called spread spectrum. Um, but. I think maybe what happened is that there's some overlap there, so you're getting sort of this interference um, because they are probably similar frequencies, and maybe the uh, sped spectrum isn't like enough. So, or it could also be overpowering. So I don't know how they're actually doing. It. If it's more directional, and then you sort of just fly in the beam of it, and it's sort of overpowering. Because that's what it looked like on the ground control station. You'd see like path, and it was actually like a diagonal line that would lose connection. It was kind of weird. So was it just on your con your radio control or was it on the ground control as well? It was on the ground control. Oh, okay. Well, radio controller was beeping a lot too. That was partly because the drone was super far away. Yeah, so the ground control is different, right? Because you guys are using probably 900 or something like that, right? So I think there is some Wi-Fi that is a 900 band. So it could be, because it is all in this sort of, um, this sort of amateur band, they do like TVs and all sorts of other stuff is, is within the sort of 900 to like 2.4 gig, right? Well, 900 and 2.4, not in between. So yeah, so anyway, so you have this sort of idea of bandwidth, which is kind of what you're talking about too, is that you have so much bandwidth, so if you're operating in narrow bandwidth, if something sort of starts operating in that bandwidth as well, you'll get some sort of interference like you're experiencing. Uh, well, there are two fundamental things. So they'll go hand in hand. So depending on how much data rate you need, uh, will determine how much bandwidth. So some of like the cell phone companies and things, they'll do a lot of like um, they'll do do a large data rate, but they'll also spread it over a larger bandwidth so they can uh, make it happen because certain frequencies only allow you to send so much data. Um, so they can sort of do this sort of handoff, or they can change the frequency a little bit. They can lower the data rate and spread it across a bandwidth, and they get a amount. The amount of data going through is is still the amount they need to do maybe like HD streaming or something like that, right? So, well, this sort of segues into this topic. So you have the different media. So you have radio, you have fiber optics, and then you also have laser beam. Which I like to think laser beam one is the coolest, just because. It's a laser beam, but I don't think, you don't really see it used very often, uh, just because in a laser beam, sort of put anything in between it, signal is completely lost. It is, however, pretty secure because you have to be able to intercept the laser beam in order to do anything with uh, communicate, like to, to, to take information down or, or maybe do uh, control with it, but Nevertheless, it's it's not very used, uh, just because of those sort of reasons, or if you have anything get in the way. So they, uh, it's noted here, it's, you have atmospheric absorption, so they don't really use it because of that, and maybe you also have other obstructions that might come in the way, say if it's clouds or something like that. Um, and then you have fiber optics. Um, I've never, I haven't heard of much being talked about other than maybe a concept on using fiber optics with UAVs, um, which I guess I imagine they're using some sort of spool system and then they're basically flying this around and, and laying down fiber as they're going. In the end, uh, they sort of would chop the fiber off, but it would probably be ideal for areas where you might have, you know, chemicals, disasters or something where you don't want to send people in, but you also want to have a secure connection. This could be also military related, but 
uh, in general, the main communication media that you'd see in UAVs is all done radio. Um, and then they also mentioned satellites. Uh, yeah, so I guess it still falls under radio, uh, right? Radio, um, radio frequency. But yeah, they're they use, you'll see a combination of using maybe satellite or just using direct communication like you would with your normal uh, radio controller. And you have to sort of operate this over this spectra, right? So there's a, have you guys, anybody seen this before? It's pretty ugly. It's not as bad as the FCC version. Anyways, it sort of outlines the different frequencies and how they sort of characterize them. So like starting from extremely low frequency all the way up to extremely high frequency. Um, you can see the variety of sort of applications. So, so these lower frequencies are definitely going to use in submarines or like um, uh, water where you have more viscosity in your medium uh, versus some of these higher frequencies where when you don't have the medium to interact with your uh, frequency, then, uh, then it's more sort of suited because you can send more information over. Typically, you'll probably use where you have radars and, and LAN, uh, so three, uh, three to thirty gigahertz. I know FPV people flying FPVs five point eight, right? You can switch it up, but it's typical because uh, you want a, a more data, you want a higher data rate. Uh, it's a faster frequency, so you can send more, uh, more data that way. And then we sort of operate in this TV, phones, air-to-air -air com, two-way radios. So it's 300 to 3,000 uh, megahertz. And if that isn't confusing, then you have IEEE to throw in the mix as well as like these US and NATO sort of acronyms. A lot of the satellite bands you'll see too are in this sort of KU, K, and KA range. Uh, and then I've never really used these sort of the, the, the NATO, US, um, the band names, but they're there for reference if you ever have to. If you guys work for a government or something, you'll probably be forced to learn that. All right, so transmitter power and out, and, and what, receiver sensitivity. So these are very two important things. I think I briefly mentioned it earlier. So transmitter power is sort of the amount of power that your transmitter will actually put out. It's, it's usually combined with your antenna gain. So you'll have your transmitter power, and, and, and the FCC regulates this to about uh, a watt. And then, um, or it might be 100 milliwatts, sorry. And then, and then you'll have your antenna gain, which sort of adds to it. And then line losses are any sort of connections in between these guys. Um, this could also be uh, actually in your your uh, transmitter as well, but it's sort of a lumped parameter if it's inside there. But if you have any lines, so say if you have a long coaxial cable to an antenna, you're going to have some loss there. Uh, and all this stuff adds up, so especially if you're trying to do really long distance stuff, um, it's going to sort of inhibit, might drop you, you know, few hundred feet to like maybe a few miles depending on how sensitive your system is. And that's where you have receiver sensitivity which isn't quite mentioned here. Um, but that's basically how sensitive your receiver is and we'll talk more about that where it's your signal to noise ratio really comes in play. So if your receiver is very sensitive that means it'll have a high signal to noise ratio and you can pick up uh, stuff better, but you also don't want to pick up too much stuff because if you pick up noise and, and then you can't really distinguish the two and that's bad. And then you have path loss, which I sort of mentioned earlier. Um, again, so the radio waves traveling through through this medium uh, and it could be different mediums, so like in the case of water, if you have a high frequency going through water, it'll dampen out pretty fast which is why they're using these lower frequencies to go through water. Um, 
So in air, or in free, or in basically, yeah, in air, the same sort of, sort of thing applies. So when we work in these higher sort of gigahertz range, um, you'll see it basically, the, the signal will dampen out faster and you can't go as far with it. So you'll see a lot more communication that's done in like the 300 to three uh, uh, gigahertz range. And it might even be lower to like, um, like 30 megahertz. So antenna types, again, definitely an important topic. Um, there's a few sort of ones that stick out. I mean, you've probably seen uh, some of these, which you'll, you'll see on the next slide. So you have like a quarter wave antenna, um, you have a Yagi parabolic dish, and um, this micro strip uh, array. So like this stuff, you probably won't see like the lens antenna. I think it's very bulky. I've never seen it used in UAVs. But I think it is also, it's used for communication. Um, and then you have this phased array microstrip. You might see anything like phased array will probably be government related, it's more expensive. Uh, I think it's a cooler sort of antenna just because it uses an array of antennas and it uses this idea of constructive and destructive um, waves. And when you're uh, using this sort of array, you can actually tune the antenna to point to certain directions. So it is a directional antenna. Um, so this quarter wave one, this is the top left. This is pretty common. You'll see this, um, is what they call like a dipole or a monopole antenna. And it's in a lot of sort of like your car. It's more of a monopole. It actually could be a dipole. Uh, there's variations um, of the design, but you'll see that in your, your car antenna. Um, the Yagi, you, you might see these on in rooftops of houses for, but the, this is also a directional antenna and it's an offshoot of a dipole um, antenna. And then you have this parabolic dish, which if anybody's seen one of these, you kind of get an idea how it works. It has a center, sort of collector emitter, and it'll sort of, uh, emit the radio frequency to this parabolic dish and it'll sort of shoot it out like a beam, which is shown in the, um, the top right, uh, noted as uh, the B subscript. Oh, yeah, more stuff. Yeah, so it's kind of talking about um, which one is sort of the, is gonna be your sort of conductor and which one's gonna be the ground. So, this quarter wavelength wire for the monopole, that'll be sort of your your conductor and then you'll have your, your coaxial feed will be sort of the ground. Um, or I was just telling you where it's coming from, sorry. This is a little confusing. Um, the dipole antenna here, it kind of shows you, actually I have more slides that'll show this in a little better detail. Um, maybe I'll just wait for that. And then this spiral antenna, I've never, have any of you guys seen one of these before? No, I don't think I have either. So I don't know how well it is. Can't really talk about it. Um, and then you have this patch antenna, which we haven't discussed yet. So it uses a very similar design as the dipole. Top plate is a conductor. Bottom plate is a um, ground. Um, and it, it's a sort of semi-directional antenna. And I'll have I have some more to show on this one later. Um, showing sort of this radiation field and what it looks like. So for design purposes, you can get an idea of what sort of antennas you want to use if you, if you want to create a communication system. Uh, so this is, this is a good example of the Yagi, which I still have more slides on these. Um, so the center is right here where you see this feeder, that is the only part that actually has power to it. This, the, 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 the two sort of pole or vertical lines uh, that are attached to the boom here in the front are actually just slightly shorter than the wavelength. So this is done on like quarter wavelength or half, so you have two quarters and then the, the combination is the half of a wavelength. So whatever frequency you're using, 
uh, it's, it's basically, and, and this is indicative of all sort of antennas, they uh, will determine which frequency or, or center frequency you can sort of pick up best based on uh, the multitude of the, the wavelength. So at, mo at the least, you want at least a quarter wavelength, but you want to probably do upwards to a, a full wavelength. Um, but if you, if you do these short, uh, these like, three, like 30 megahertz, your your wave your wavelength is very long, and so you'd have to have like a really long like pole or something to to actually pick up on the the this um, radio frequency. And then this pole on the back here, this vertical one on the back, is uh, just a little bit longer, and that's actually what creates this sort of characteristic uh, radiation pattern. Um, so these things on the side, they're called lobes or side lobes. Here they're uh, shown as minor lobes. And then in the front is a, what's called a major lobe. So this is really where the design comes into play. Um, so the, the idea is sort of to get this really long lobe out in front and then you can use that to sort of, if you're doing like a point to point communication system like you'll see in uh, let's say a microwave system in the cellular network, they'll just line them up and they're both very directional antennas and then you'll use that to send information really long distances. So this is an interesting graph. Um, you can take a second to kind of look at it. Uh, but in terms of, I don't know, frequency, you can kind of see how the frequency and if this is the diameter of um, the dish um, this changes how, how much the beam width is. So if, what they mean by beam width is, mm. so when you have um, minus, or a 3 dB drop, so does anyone know what that, what is 3 dB? You guys know? Yeah, it's three decibels, but what does that mean? What's significant about it? It's like it, yeah. So 3 dB is actually half so you drop your power by half. So when you drop your, then that's how they measure the, 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 the beam width. So when you have power and it drops by half, so it, when it does 3 dB drop, they'll measure it on this line here. And they'll just do like a vertical line in this case. And where it crosses the, the lobe, like the out part of the lobe, you'll draw two lines from the center. And that angle is what they refer to as the, the beam width. So in this graph here, or table, sorry. They're talking about beam width in degrees. So you can see like for some of these, we have these very high frequencies like 38 gigahertz. You can see that the beam width actually gets very, very tiny. So this is in, is this in meters? Oh no, it's in degrees, sorry. So 0.12 degrees, that's small. Pretty much like a laser, right? So if that thing shoots like 10 miles, right? And it's only got something like that, like it's, you have to make sure that you're lined up pr precisely, otherwise you won't see it. Uh, so we talked a little earlier about multipathing. Um, uh, so this shows a good example of kind of what that means. So you have, few, you have sort of diffraction, refraction, and um, reflection. Um, so this sort of path on the, the bottom is showing like sort of what's being refracted. So when it goes through a medium, it'll sort of bend the, the radio frequency. Uh, sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. In this case, it might not be. Um, then you get diffraction where it sort of hits and it'll sort of split uh, the frequency in multiple directions and then a direct path. And we'll talk more a little bit about the effects of multipathing. But in general, if, if these were, if you even just look at the refracted path versus the direct path, it's much longer. So in that time frame of, of the, the way, the, assuming you don't have any change in frequency, uh, one's going to be longer than the other, so it's going to be uh, showing a phase shift. So if the phase shift is, you know, too much, if it's too much out of phase, it can be completely destructive and your signal just goes away. 
Okay, so this is simplex versus a full duplex system. Uh, your receiver, your radio controller is kind of like a simplex system. So you send commands to the, the aircraft, it doesn't send anything back. The ground control station has a transceiver, which would be like a duplex system where it can actually both transmit and receive. So it has um, it has ways to use um, to basically isolate itself from the receiver and transmitter part, and then it can um, it can do both right without interfering with itself. Uh, this is sort of a I guess a block diagram showing you kind of how this sort of works, right? So you get some information. This could be in form of data or like um like a binary sort of um, digital data or it could also be like analog data and then it goes through this modulator and the modulator is going to do something to it so it could be um, what they really call frequency shift keying which is on the next slide um, or it could be some other form of modulation so that way when it sends it to this mixer frequency synthesizer it'll do what we were talking about earlier where we have the spread spectrum and there's not a, um, I might be able to pull it up later if you remind me, but there's basically what it does is it takes a frequency and it sort of hops it around. So you might have a bandwidth and you have multiple center frequencies. And so it takes this information that you have and it modulates it into something that it can send. And then it'll bounce it around center frequencies. And the idea is that it has this pattern that never repeats or it repeats very, very long um, time. So that way when you're sending information, it, you're less likely to interfere with somebody. And also if somebody's trying to hack your system, uh, they have to wait a really long time to see the pattern to try and break sort of this code. But if the receiver knows the code or has some idea of how the pattern goes, it can sync up with it and then receive your uh, signal. So then it'll basically be, once it's spread out through this sort of uh, bandwidth, it's amplified and they send it down to the receiving antenna, you might get some noise with this. Uh, and then this, uh, you have a low noise filter which basically spreads out the noise. Um, and then it, again, it'll take these sort of uh, frequencies that are hopped around and it'll recombine them and then demodulate it. And now you have information that you can use, which could be in the form of, you know, left rudder or like ailerons or something of that sort. So just to show you again, so this is, you might have something like this data, and then this, in this way, the, the frequency shift keying, they sort of do like a fast frequency for the ones, a slower frequency for the zeros, and, and the, the voltage level might be, looks something like this, but it's sampled every so often, so they can kind of get an idea of what it looks like. Any questions at that point? I think, this is the end of this slide deck. I spent more time on it than I thought I would. Any questions? No? Too good? Boring? Interesting? All right, so. All right, hold on, let's go back. Yes, what time's a good time for a break? You say 10.15 is normally when you guys? Uh, usually it's around 10.50. 10.50? 10 10 yeah. Okay. I mean, if you guys want to power through it, I'll go through this one as well. So now that we got some basics right on communication, um, this sort of talk was on long distance or long range sort of drones. Um, so we sort of have to answer the question, right, why, why, are we, why long distance drones, right? So there's a variety of applications that we can uh, look at. So we have pipeline surveillance. Uh, this is something that I um, was working on before, but you'd be surprised how much this is needed in like industry, uh, not just in like the US, but in, in the world, right? Um, and a lot of this sort of, the slides that you'll see in here are 
Some of it is from the work that we did on this through my capstone, as well as uh, some of it is new. Uh, so then you have search and rescue, right? So this is something that's come up before. So if, if you have a large area you want to search, uh, you need something that can do it. And sometimes rapid response is faster than sending like a guy with a helicopter and they have to sort of come in. So if you have something on site, it's a lot better. Disaster monitoring, this is this is a, a pretty big one too, right? Because some a hurricane hits, a flood hits, something kills power communications. How do you assess what's going on? What's sort of so you can send some eyes up, but if if you're if you're limited to sort of a quad rotor, you can't go very far. Maybe a quarter mile, half mile, where you sort of lose it. Uh, agricultural sensing. As crops get bigger, we want to be able to sense these things. So there's some background on pipeline surveillance stuff. This is actually in LA area. So this is shot with a, a, a FLIR camera. Um, so normally you can't really see these things in IR, but this leak is so big that you can. And uh, what I've been told by SoCal Gas is that you don't even have to see it you can smell it so it's caused a bunch of ir like irritation like nausea vomiting for a lot of the residents in the area but this is basically a gas leak things that we want to try and prevent by using these long distance drones um, so we we, part we were working with pg e uh, trying to understand you know their problems they have this very very large sort of area that they need to cover um, you know it spans all the way up and down sort of california uh, these are all um, uh, distribution and transmission pipelines. So these transmission pipelines will send larger sort of amounts of uh, gas and natural gas and stuff um, from different larger cities and then in the cities they'll distribute it. Um, so there's two different sort of caveats of that. And the current ways they sort of do this is through like by foot so they'll actually measure um, They'll go around with a sensor. Um, they've used like this, what's called an RMLD or uh, various sort of um, detectors that use like flame ionization. It takes in the gas and sort of if the, the ioni if it ionizes, it'll give you some electrical signal and then they can sort of measure the, the methane that way. Uh, what's shown in the picture up here is actually a sensor that we've put on a drone, which I'll show later to try and measure um, the methane at a much smaller level than what currently is out there. And then they use also vehicles, so this is a new technology that they're trying to do, relatively new. Uh, it's uh, it's um, through this company called Picaro, and what they do is they send this sensitive sort of sniffer on top of a car, and they can measure uh, airspeed and wind speed and stuff in the car, and then, so when they get measurements, they can kind of guess where they think the, uh, the leak is coming from, and over a variety of hits, they can say, you know, with some reasonable sort of confidence, an area. And then they've also used helicopters. So for the helicopters are more for these transmission lines um, to, to prevent people from digging. Um, and I kind of wish I had some of these other slides showing the disasters where you have somebody that digged into a pipeline because they don't know that's there and it blew up and it, like this happened in Bakersfield, it killed one and injured three. Um, also in uh, San Bruno, they had an incident where they weren't able to detect a gas leak. It uh, basically ended up blowing up, killed like eight people and injured dozens. So there's major sort of controversy over that. So they, they really want to sort of push safety and that's a lot of the sort of motivation behind uh, pipeline surveillance, but also you have search and rescue, right? If someone got lost out here, how'd you find them? Communication is not very good. So you need like ways to sort of try and find people. Avalanche area, same thing, right? Very hard to find these things or, or even get communication out there. So being able to remotely set up long distance, long distance sort of communication is very key. Right, foresty areas. That's more of a hard one, I think. 
it's hard to get people out. It's hard to see down in the floor. We also talked about disaster monitoring, right? The flood happened, knocks out power. How do you, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you find people? Or assess the damage? And then you have remote sensing, right? So we, I think you mentioned like agriculture or, or even this could be like vernal pools. So the information we can get from satellites is not very good, but we can do a lot better with, uh, with uh, UAVs, right? Just in terms of the resolution is just immense. So yeah, I should mention that this is uh, some of the work from Brandon Stark. Um, so I also have some stuff from uh, Tibia as well in this slide deck. Uh, but yeah, just getting information like this, you normally wouldn't get from using other technologies, you, or at least to the scale that we want. Um, combination of sensors, you can get a lot more information than just you know, uh, RGB, you can use near infrared or shortwave infrared, and it gives you different information about, uh, about the area you're trying to research. So I got, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, how some of this stuff is stitched together, but essentially you take a, a bunch of pictures, uh, then using software they can sort of line up where all these pictures overlap and then the software, whether they're geo-referenced or not, will sort of estimate where these pictures are taken and then sort of stitch all the, the pixels together from a point cloud and then, and then you can get good maps of areas that otherwise you'd have to use other sort of um, resources like satellite, right? Satellite imagery. But the amount of detail you can get is a lot better. So again, like in, in terms of crops, right, you can, I won't go into too much detail here. So you can sort of see that they've stitched this image together. There's markers for calibration. Um, and then you can get information from uh, infrared or near infrared on what the water looks like, right? Um, and I remember correctly, the darker spots are the Darker spots are where it's more wet, the lighter spots are sort of where it's dry, so you can kind of see where maybe sprinklers are leaking or... Uh, so this is all good information for farmers, and if, if you have a very large crop, this is where sort of long distance comes in, into play. So, so some of the work I'm going to show later is sort of based on this mission statement. Uh, so we wanted to create a drone that can go 100 miles. Uh, we wanted to try and do it under 100,000. We didn't physically build it. It was sort of a uh, goal. Like that's where uh, our industry partner wanted to set the number. And we want our flights typically for 15 to 30 miles an hour. Uh, and then our altitude between 100 and 500 feet. So at the time, this was before part 107. So we had a COA, uh, a section 333 COA. Uh, so now it'd be more likely if we're operating under part 107, it'd be 400 feet. So let me see what, we got time. Um, so state of the art, so what does that even look like? Um, so I have a few sort of aircrafts, I have about five that I was gonna show you in terms of state of the art, sort of long distance stuff. There is more since then. Um, uh, with UAVs, they sort of rapidly evolve, so this slide deck isn't uh, completely up to date. Uh, one of the ones that points, uh, basically stands out is this Lancaster 5 from Precision Hawk. Um, and they're designed in a way to be like modular. They hit a variety of topics from precision ag to remote sensing. Um, so this is a pretty cool shot of sort of this modular based drone, it breaks down completely. Uh, it has a modular bay for different sensor payloads, so you basically plug and play. Um, I imagine if you have new stuff, you'd have to sort of integrate with this company, but um, that's sort of the baseline. Uh, so there's some specs on this guy. Um, so communication range, you have 1.2 miles. This will give you an idea, this is sort of a standard. This isn't meant completely for long range. 
in the sense, in the traditional sense of radio communication, but uh, as I'll should talk about here in a, a bit, they, they are using it for um, possibly f for long distance uh, through uh, cellular networks. Um, do I have the flight time? Oh, the flight time's here. So flight time's 45 minutes. You guys can do the math. If you travel 30 miles an hour, 45 minutes, can't get very far, right? Maybe 20-something miles, right? Um, but that's sort of the, the baseline, right? The, the reason why I put it up there, though, is that these guys are partnered up with the FAA and NASA to do what's called this Pathfinder program. And uh, this is part of the UTM, and we'll talk about this a little later, too, but it's sort of to push out uh, um, the concept of UTM and, and, and how to sort of deal with safety. One of the ways they do that is through this thing called Lattice. And it, this is actually a hint, hint in your quiz. So this, this is um, what they call cellular-based low-altitude traffic and airspace safety. So they're using cellular networks to get information from other aircraft. So I mean, it could be helicopters, planes, um, and this could be uh, I think in the image here it shows that you're getting some of the information from satellite or maybe you're talking to satellites. But the idea around it is that is that you can get information about other aircraft in the area through cellular networks. Before they do this thing called ADSB, um, which is the automatic dependent broadcast system. Uh, and not all aircrafts use it. So crop dusters and stuff, it's too expensive for them, they won't use it. So if you're flying in and around areas that operate these aircraft, you're more than likely you might have an incident. So they're trying to come up with low-cost solutions to mitigate this. Uh, so the, the second one is this Dell Air Tech DT-18. Um, this is a French uh, aircraft. Uh, the main reason why I put this guy on here is that in France they have beyond visual line of sight certification. If you want to do anything long distance, I mean foreseeably over like a half a mile because it's very hard to see that far. Um, you need something that can do it, and these guys have actually have a certification or plane that is certified to do this. Um, also, the endurance here is about a two hour endurance, which is pretty remarkable, right? It's, um, so, the next one is this little bit larger aircraft from the same company. It's the DT 26X, right? So, it, um, well, that's kind of weird. So it has a 2.5 hour like endurance, right? Which this is huge. I mean, even if you're traveling 30 miles an hour, you might be able to get to the 100 miles, um, maybe with a little bit of boost, right? But I mean, you need to start looking at aircrafts like this to actually get that far, right? So the Aggie or Blue Jay um, is, a newer aircraft um, is from Utah State. Um, so when Dr. Chen first came here, they were operating off of the predecessor, which I will talk about in a second. Um, however, this guy is still in testing. I would like to have one. Um, it's about a 10 feet wingspan, the 200 minute flight time, which is pretty good, right? It's over three hours. Um, it uh, travels at a faster speed, but I mean, there's probably some leeway to sort of redesign how you sort of sample and uh, maybe there's a way to, to use it, but that, this is more sort of um, useful for long distance. And this is their, their launcher right now, I think, for testing, which I thought was pretty cool, right? You just drive a truck and just let it, let it launch off the top. And so previously they've used a catapult, right? So this is the Minion. So this is one that I've, if some of you guys have been in Mesa before, um, you've probably seen this. We have a blue one. Um, uh, this was a pretty good platform. Uh, you can do a lot of good science on it. Uh, it's got a nine foot wingspan, roughly 60, uh, 60 minute flight time uses two 10 amp hour lithium batteries, right? It's quite a bit heavy. 
18 pounds takeoff weight. But still, even these being like pretty state of the art, I like most planes you'll see are like in, in where anywhere from you know 60 minutes to two and a half hours. You rarely see planes that can go three hours under electric power um, currently, right? All right, so general requirements. So in order to sort of develop a long distance platform, we need to look at a few things. So we need, you know, the airframe. We need to look at how we navigate and control this thing. We need to look at communication, which we've talked about earlier. We need to look at what system constraints we have. Um, this could be legal or physical. Um, and then we can take a look at different strategies that people use to combine these. Uh, so the airframe, you know, just from showing you guys these few platforms, require a few key things, right? So they need uh, they need to deal with uh, lift-induced drag, parasitic drag, lift and wing loading, um, because the data is sort of the mission. So we want to design this plane to carry a payload. If most of the stuff, if we can't carry a payload, then there's no point. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on lift-induced drag. So I don't know, have you, did you guys taken classes on this or aerodynamics? No, so a few of you could be a refresher. So essentially what's going on is that anytime you have air that's basically diverted, you'll generate some lift. So it's shown in here, the uh, symbol phi um, or phi. Um, so anyway, so when you when you divert a certain angle, so here's 45 degrees, you'll produce a lift vector and you also produce a drag vector. Um, so if you're diverting a lot of air, it's not really good for you because you're creating drag for your aircraft. So you want to sort of reduce the amount that you're you're moving uh, to create more lift and less drag. So in case you want to see some of these equations. Um, there's basically, this is the more rudimentary form, where you have K is a constant, Q is your dynamic head, uh, L is the length of the wings, and B is your uh, cord length. So the drag, the parasitic drag is calculated using the drag coefficient, constant in the, the coefficient of uh, lift, as well as the dynamic head and the, the surface area. But what you can see from the graph, though, is that you have, uh, how air density affects this. So as we have more air density, we can generate more lift, also more drag. Um, so a lot of times you'll see people sort of operate in higher altitudes or like aircrafts, like a commercial, to try and reduce this effect and then they can be more efficient. However, it sort of comes with the cost, right? So this is also, um, yeah, because some aircraft can't fly that high, right? Doesn't have enough thrust to maintain lift. And then we also have to deal with this thing called uh, loading, so and wing loading, min minimum lift and wing loading. Um, so you have a minimum flight speed, and you have wing loading here on the x-axis. Uh, so you, to sort of give perspective, you have two drones here. So you have the Predator and the Global Hawk, which are larger aircraft. Um, but it gives you an idea of those as as you have to do more wing loading, you have to maintain a higher speed. So there's this relationship uh, between both of them. And then also in lift, you sometimes you'll have to increase the angle of attack, and then you start inducing more parasitic drag. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a number of factors that play into this, and I like to think when you design these things, you have to sort of do it iteratively. So you, you change one parameter, you see how the outcome is, you change one, and it's sort of this guess and check that to get to get a well-designed aircraft. So yeah, you have effects on minimum flight speed, altitude capabilities, amount of payload that can be carried, right? Uh, and all this stuff affects type of applications we can use, how the data is collected, um, and how complex it has to be. So now we have this navigation and control. So I won't go too much detail. So you have this sort of civilian band or like accuracy, um, which is in 10 
It's a standard positioning service. So it's about 10 meter accuracy. It's usually what you'll see in most most um, GPSs. And then you have precision position service, which is more military grade. Um, it has to do with how they do the air uh, corrections. Um, but it uses like an L band, so um, uh, I won't go too much to detail on that one. But it uses a combination of these, uh, these satellites, triangulates, and tells you where you're at uh, in Earth respective to the satellites. Um, all right, so inertial navigation. So we have, uh, in order to sort of know what we're doing or, or using any sort of a automation, we need sort of a three-axis accelerometer and a three-axis gyro so we can tell if we're rotating or if we're um, with respect to all the, uh, the axes. Um, so we can tell what sort of our uh, angle is, if it needs to be fixed or not. Um, and this is all inputted into the PID system or c controller, which is the proportional integral derivative controller, um, which is all fine and dandy. But um, and uh, but it, it's coupled with the GPS, you know, to correct for these things. So use a combination of both, and it kind of knows where it's where it's at. But when you lose GPS, you have this thing called dead reckoning. Um, where it'll take these measurements from the IMU and it'll use it to kind of guess where they think it's, um, where, where, where you think you're going. So based on the, the, the measurements from the IMU. And one of the downside is, is that you have, if you have wind, right, if you have no way to measure the wind and how it inputs into your system, you could be flying one direction and you think you're, you're going, uh, uh, over here on the bottom, but you, in reality you've moved because the wind sort of pushed you. So if you don't have GPS to sort of measure uh, where you at or where you at on the, the Earth, then you can't um, be certain that you're actually there. All right. So we already talked about this a little bit: laser, fiber optics, radio. Uh, sort of gives you a visual perspective of it. Though this one is a little more confusing. Um, if you have any questions or anything, you can always feel free to stop anytime. We also did look at this as well. So one of the things um, in radio, I guess, or in ham radio in particular, which is also in the quiz here, uh, is that I don't know if you guys are familiar with ham radio, but it's an amateur radio band and they use it for like CB radio. You'll see truckers use it. You'll see, uh, depending on which frequencies you're, you're in, you will have to abide by ham radio or you'll have to get a ham radio license. Uh, but there was some confusion and some arguments on where the name actually come from. And one of the things I found was that it came from these three, uh, three people. So you have Heinrich Hertz, who helped develop the theory of electromagnetic waves. Edwin uh, Howard Armstrong invented FM modulation. And then uh, uh, Guglielmo Marconi, I don't know, I'm pretty sure I butchered that name, uh, first to transmit signals across the Atlantic. So the sort of key players in, in radio frequency, um, I'll leave it up there for a second. wait until people stop looking down and but yeah there's some confusion there's also some um, some talk that this came out of a uh, I want to say it was MIT one of their first broadcast sort of centers uh, from the three people that helped start it so in the ham radio, so they're broken up into different frequencies, like I was talking about. So I've listed a few here. So you have 433, 900, 1.3, 2.4, and 5.8. Um, depending on the, f the, the certification, so a lot of your equipment that you guys would use, or at least in, in the lab with the radio controllers, they're all certified through the FCC. And you can kind of know because if you have this part, 15 on your, or it's this part 15 sticker on your um, device, then it's certified and you can use it. 
Um, if you don't, then you have to probably check the legal constraints and make sure that you're operating within FCC guidelines. Um, yeah, so most bands, I guess, uh, I think I put, it's, it's 100 milliwatts or one watt. I think I have my notes, I have one watt. I should know this off the top of my head. Uh, anyway, so a, a good general rule of thumb, and this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, was that with higher frequencies, you have higher data speeds. You have shorter transmitting dis distances. Lower frequency, slower data speeds, longer transmitting distance. Um, so I've already talked about quite a bit of this stuff. Some of this stuff kind of overlaps quite nicely. Uh, so you have line of sight, which we sort of talked about, line loss, free space loss, uh, power multipathing, antenna selection was something new. Well, no, we talked about some antennas. Signal to noise ratio was only briefly discussed. Link margin and reliability are new. So what I was talking about earlier is you have this sort of refraction. So you can kind of use this to your benefit. Um, I probably wouldn't if you're trying to design a robust system. Um, but you can see where I've kind of highlighted in green that if you had a transmitter at about 100 feet, um, so that would be like your tower and you're flying at 500 feet, um, so you, you could roughly get like 41 miles, right? Um, line of sight. Now the radio horizon will actually arc, it'll be refracted a little bit depending on how you, which frequency you're using. But what we've calculated here is about 54 miles. So you get quite a bit longer, but the chances of getting some sort of interference or uh, some sort of signal degradation is a lot greater. So I would probably not design it around that. If it's a stationary system, maybe. If it's mobile, probably not. So then you have this idea of free space loss, which I think this visual helps sort of solidify it. Um, and we have the path loss here to kind of show you that what kind of happens when you have different um, frequencies. And then just sort of iterative, I guess, more or less, as you have you know, higher frequencies, like 5.8, you have much higher sort of path loss. And then it goes down uh, as frequency goes down. And then there's an equation here governing, uh, governing um, how to calculate the path loss and then this is all in db, so it's, it's all log based, so that's why you can do it as plus and minus. Yeah, yeah it's sort of iterative. So measure, all the power is basically measured in db or dbm, uh, depending on how you do it. So 3 dB gain is equal to twice the power. I think we, I'd mentioned that before. Um, FCC limits to one watt. Transmitter power plus the out antenna gain will give you the output power. I feel like it's a lot of really reiterative stuff. It was meant for two separate sort of days, so it's sort of some of it's supposed to be refresher, but since you guys are getting it all in one go. Yeah, so in this one, it actually it shows quite a bit, actually, because you have refraction, you have sort of line of sight. You get some sort of refraction from the ground, but then you also get multipathing, right? Uh, and I was saying earlier, sort of, that's bad. You don't want, I can, I, have, I think some slides I can talk about multipathing and what we experience. So this is sort of very iterative. This is actually a pretty good graphic, kind of shows you that you have the shielding right here and then your center conductor. And then these are both quarter wavelength. So if you wanted to build your own sort of antenna, not very hard. You just get a coaxial cable, there's a sort of metal shielding on it. You have a center conductor. Center conductor connects to one line that's a quarter wavelength of whatever frequency you're trying to receive or transmit from. And the shielding gets connected to the other wire and they're not connected. Um, at all, and it'll create a, a radio frequency, f uh, a radiation field, and I'll show that in a second. So the, 
yeah, again, this is sort of the, the patch antenna. Um, and everything is done in terms of wavelength. So like you can see, this one has a combination of wavelength. These aren't shown, but we built one of these before and they were based on some ratio of wavelength to do all this stuff, to tune it properly. Yep, so I already talked about beam width. This is sort of a good example, or at least a visual showing showing beam width. Uh, so like right where the 3 dB mark is, uh, and then you're just measuring that back to the center. So this is an interesting Yagi. Um, so the idea behind this sort of these these uh, spacing the name of it, the proper name. You have like reflectors and directors. So these these are directors that are all in the front. <laughs> the more you put for these Yagis, the higher dB gain you get from it. However, the efficiency goes down. So if you're designing these things. There's an optimal set of directors that you want to put on it. Um, so the lobes kind of look like this. So this is actually uh, what I believe was this was calculated um, the radiation field, so you can kind of see roughly what the spread is. So this one looks like a 60 degree spread. Actually, maybe on both. Uh, this one looks a little smaller, uh, but that, that's in terms of uh, one axis or the other. So it's just kind of giving you an idea of what the shape looks like. So that's a directional antenna. And then you have what, what we talked about earlier, a dipole or monopole. Um, so these are actually both dipoles. The other one is a different design. Um, I don't have much background on that. The, the sort of a traditional dipoles in the bottom and what happens is that when you have the power and ground, <clears throat> it creates a sort of flux or this radiation field that travels from one end to the other, and it creates a sort of donut-like shape. So they call these an isotropic antenna, but it's, um, it's not really isotropic. It's sort of a th only a theory thing. Like, you can't really get an isotropic radiation pattern. Um, you can get pretty close, so like on one axis it looks like it's completely isotropic, but then you get this sort of, uh, this little void area here. Um, so in your um, receipt or in your remote controls, you'll see that your pole, your um, your antenna is up, and sometimes, sometimes people will actually point that at the aircraft. Um, and then knowing now from what I'm showing you is that that would be like pointing the aircraft like right here. So you're not even in the radiation field. Therefore, you get no signal and people wonder why it's not working. So you can always point it with the antenna sideways and you'll be sure to more or less get the signal uh, transmitted properly. Uh, so this is a patch antenna. This is what I was talking about. This is like a semi-directional sort of antenna. Um, it, it's somewhat uh, isotropic, but it also, because of the way that the plate is on the bottom, it will actually direct the sort of isotropic field up. Um, and you'll see these in like the GPSs and stuff, and it's very good because you don't want it too directional because then you won't hit the satellite, but you also want it to be, um, you don't want to sort of project the radiation field down because you're not getting satellite information there. So for this sort of design or like how they've chosen this for the GPS uh, receivers is sort of ideal case for them, right? So they have a large sort of isotropic field that's sort of pointed upward. All right, circular polarized. So in the helical antenna, which is a sort of circular antenna I'll show you in the next slide, you have <clears throat> circular polarization. So depending on which way this is coiled, and sometimes this also, you can have these in patch antennas as well, um, and other antennas. 
uh, like a, this, a clover leaf, which I'll show, uh, they have a certain polarization to them. So if you want to make your system ideal, you need to match polarizations. Um, so like the dipole antenna, those are what's called linear, linearly polarized. These guys are circular polarized and you need to match it. So they'll have right hand, right hand circular polarized or left hand circular polarized. Um, <clears throat> and if you don't match them, you might not get like a, you might not be able to transfer the power effectively. So this is one of the antennas that we designed for uh, this long distance project. Um, so I rendered an image for, uh, so it was for visual, so not as pretty in real life. Um, but the, we, we, we try to make as high as gain as possible. And we end up finding that like four, four coils um, was sufficient. Now, similarly to how Yagi's where you add directors, you add DB. Uh, in a helical coil or antenna, when you add more coils, you also add dB. And the same thing applies where we lose efficiency as uh, as we gain as we add more more coils. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, is that we have a four coiled or um, antenna on the left, and then a six on the right. Now the fields look pretty similar, but you see that we have more side lobes on the on the six. And we only gained, um, what is it? It's 9.6 dB, dBi on the, the, the four coil and then 11 dBi on the six. So this is sort of handoff. So if we want to actually put this on a drone or something, you add more coils, you add weight, and it's back to the whole lift problem, um, dealing with how do we make the aircraft efficient so we can put the proper sort of instruments on to do data collection. Uh, however, this is actually for the ground, so if we really needed to, we could run a, uh, a higher dB antenna and do six coils or more. So this is another one. So circular polarized antennas can also be isotropic or pseudo-isotropic. Um, so this is an example of a right-hand circular polarized cloverleaf antenna. Um, Sometimes you'll see a difference. So when you're using these like an FPV, for instance, um, your, your transmitter will probably have four lobes and your receiver might have three. Or it could be the other way around, right? <clears throat> but basically, uh, it's used to sort of pick up the signal better and transmit better. All right, Synad sensitivity. And we're like right on your break time, right? Let me have any do I have? Let me finish this slide and the next slide, and then we can probably break, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so synod sensitivity is the signal to noise and disturbance sort of ratio. Um, it's sort of shown in this graph, right? What I was explaining earlier, you have this level of, of signal that you, you want to retrieve. You get noise added to the system. The ratio of the two is used to um, to determine sort of how uh, sensitive your receiver is. So if your receiver has a certain uh, synad sensitivity, then it, it'll determine how much you can sort of pick up. So I have an example here. So like for a video length of 900 megahertz, um, we have a path loss of 135 dB. Um, if our video transmitting power without an antenna, so we took it out for uh, robustness, is 30 dB, then our receiving antenna power was 9.6, is what we, we built, right? We can add these up and get what's called a phase margin. Um, so we'll get a power, we'll get, um, and then we subtract that from our receiver sensitivity. And this phase, fade margin is what is used to determine reliability. So they use this, um, Rayleigh's distribution to sort of, and there's some other math that goes into this, but for anything within 100 miles, this thing holds true, or it's a good estimate of it. So for instance, if we have 25.9 dB fade margin, we can go over to a graph like this and we can say, okay, we have 99% link reliability. And that's sort of 
how you would want to design it. And if you start dropping where you don't have much phage margin, then your reliability will start going out the window. It'll drop off. That's probably it. We can stop here for now. I don't want to talk about that yet. So. All right, so there's a few slides left on this one. The other one is kind of long, but I think we have roughly, what, an hour and a half left, so um, I'll try and wrap this one up pretty fast, and then we'll see what we can get through on the other one on the UTM stuff. All right, so constraints. So we have sort of... Um, in terms of long range systems, you have constraints in part, like through part 107 with the visual line of sight rules. Um, UTM is a big factor in it because we not only have to have sort of get around this line of sight thing, but we also have to know how we can sort of communicate with other aircrafts. Um, we have power limitations through the FCC as stated earlier, about a one watt. so. Uh, in longer range communication, they'll just amp the, the power output, and we can't do that. And then you have the physical limitations. Um, how much have you guys, as Brandon, give a talk on like legality stuff? So you guys are pretty familiar with Part 107 now. How many of you guys are going to get the Part 107? I'd like to try. I already have it. Yeah, you already have it. Yeah, I know you're on the list. Yep, so I won't go too much into detail then on this stuff. Uh, they do give you like a whole host of sort of uh, things that you have to abide by. The cool part is you can waive a lot of these things, but you have to build some safety cases and submit it to the FAA. They sort of will get back to you 90 days and tell you whether or not you can do it. Um, they usually will last about like three years yeah. So the main one that we're really concerned with, at least in long distance, is the visual line of sight. Um, what else we got? Um, yeah, I also mentioned the 90 day thing. Um, you have to del do some delegation stuff. This is actually in terms of the waiver stuff. So if you guys ever, or if you get your part 107 and you want to sort of do like night flying, which I think is currently becoming easier to get now you can fill out a waiver and do this whole process. Uh, what else we got? Yeah, so this some of this stuff is from previous sort of testing. So the idea was to sort of test in the, the vernal pools. You don't have quite 100 miles there, but we might be able to simulate or get as far as we can. Um, Yeah, so a lot of the research in doing this stuff is mitigating risk, a lot of boring stuff. So to sort of do these um, waiver processes, you have to go through these performance-based standards. So you just meeting the FAA's criteria, and, and when you do these, um, you sort of just showcase like how you're doing this. So if you want to operate out here, we can, uh, which is becoming maybe easier i mean in the near future um we can sort of pseudo do beyond visual line of sight right now by using multiple visual observers and following the aircraft but uh it's definitely you have to fall by these performance-based standards um, and all these are sort of available on the faa's website in case you guys want to look it up so so I did talk a little bit about ADSB, or at least mentioned it. So that's the automatic dependent surveillance broadcast. Uh, so one of these things that was done for Beyond Visual Line of Sight was that Utah sort of Aggie, Aggie Air uh, combined this with what's called Neuro, 
you know, some network enhanced UAS range operations. So it's this sort of internet based approach or application based that combines the ADSB um, system so they can actually broadcast from the ground or they know where the GP they know where your aircraft is, they're putting it into their system and then they're broadcasting it into the ADSB environment so that other aircraft know that there is a drone there and then vice versa they can get information from the system um, and that's very like sort of useful so I think in their case too that they've they've actually done this and they had an aircraft that was coming into their airspace and we file NOTAMs which is notice to airmen uh, telling them that hey we're gonna fly in this area so be careful and they were actually coming into their airspace and they communicate to them via um, VHF radios and the the pilot was kind of like yeah yeah you're, yeah right like you're not operating a drone like this this high I think they were in a maybe at the ceiling or not the ceiling the floor of E class which is about 700 feet so they weren't sort of believe like they didn't really trust that you actually had a drone up there, but they were all doing all the steps and communicating, uh, which is what you should be doing. So, yeah, the downside is that traditional ADSB is very bulky; it's heavy. That's why they didn't put it on there. They left it on the ground and they used this sort of relay system to uh, get the information uh, to the other um, air traffic in the area. Um, it can receive some weather information, um, but it's a stepping stone right towards UTM. I put this um, this graphic in here because it kind of showcases this this envelope. And in, in planes, this is you really want to be cautious of this because if you're going to collide with somebody, you have a certain detection range that you need to detect this aircraft in order to sort of divert, like with the blue line. Um, if you're not, in, if you can't get out of the way or see the aircraft or detect it within that time, you might fall into this sort of red line where you might actually hit an aircraft. And I don't think there's been drone strikes, at least with, with larger aircraft, but in the, the slide deck I'll show in a little bit, there are some stats on this. Um, <clears throat> So for, for further research in a sense and avoid is definitely needed because we have to sort of be able to detect these things. Um, and this could be through Lattice, what I was mentioning earlier with the cellular based technology that can kind of track where things are going. Uh, I like to think of it as more of a passive uh, way because they can't exactly detect. They can sort of get information and <coughs> navigate around it. Um, the, the one here, this is an ADSB sort of system. You have, this is four drones. The combination is about two grand in case you want to purchase one. It's expensive. Uh, but it's a GPS and a transceiver that allows you to sort of ping your signal out and then also receive signals from ADSB. But I also, I think I mentioned earlier that these, these small aircrafts, some of them don't have it. So how do you detect these things that don't have ADSB? So one, one way you might be able to do it is through radar, but radar is also very bulky too. And if you want to live in the land of the small UAS rating, it's kind of hard to sort of put all this stuff on there and your data instruments and keep it under 55 pounds. Um, so the little, um, the little graphic up here kind of gives you an idea of what ADSB does as far as communicating with a variety of... Uh, variety of, of objects, planes, weather. So UTM, so I will talk, this slide will come up later. So we're gonna talk a little like strategies. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, so you have a point to point system with tracking. Um, we talked a little bit about cellular based technologies, very dependent on the network itself, network fails. So does your link. If you're flying 10 miles away, you're completely blind, right? Um, one of the ideas we try to do is a repeater station. You can do this with other aircraft as well. Uh, uh, so it, another cool way you can do tracking is, is through this um, basically RSSI type technique where they're 
They're using a, a multitude, like an array of directional antennas, and they're measuring the signal strength of each antenna, and they can use that to sort of hone in on where the object is. So if you're, I mean, this could be for military applications or, of course, I mean, hobbyist people wouldn't have something like this, but you can use it to sort of try and track someone that's flying in your airspace that's emitting some signal. Could be like ADSB, for instance. All right, so this goes into some of my capstone stuff. So one of the things we, we did is we, we looked at some current options that we had. So we use this Aero platform. Uh, it has GPS, IMU, uh, compass. It's all controlled through PIDs inside the, the, flight, um, the flight controller. Um, we're using communication with both circular and linear polarized equipment, so linear for the, the telecommands and um, the telemetry, and then we're using a circular based for the video, which also had overlaid um, telemetry on the screen. And then we're using, yeah, ADSB wasn't used, but we were using tracking, the idea was using tracking with an elevated sort of platform. So this is what the plane looks like. Um, it has about a 45 minute flight time, or 40 minute as shown here. We've gotten like 45 pretty, we can do 45 pretty regularly. Um, so I won't go into detail too much, but we fly at typically around 12 meters a second. It's like 20, 30 miles an hour. Um, This is sort of a schematic of how you would sort of run the, the, the controls. It's not to scale or anything. So you have the flight controller. It's getting information from the airspeed sensors, the GPS compass. Um, and then you're communicating this stuff, all the health through the telemetry receiver. You're receiving all your forward commands through your RC receiver. And then it's outputting this stuff to like the motors uh, through the ESC and also through the like um, through your ailerons, rudder, elevator, and also payloads. So if you have any sort of camera systems or gimbals or whatever you want to, um, you can control that through that way. Uh, as an example of what the flight software looks like, I don't know if you guys use this in this class. Or no, I think you guys use like QT or like Q ground control. Or have you guys got that far yet? We use Q, we try to download Q ground control. And That's the GitHub problem? I think we're using it here. Okay. Uh, although, yeah, Q ground control is what they use. Okay. So this is an example of another flight control software, or enough, uh, ground control software, sorry. Um, so you might get some video back uh, and then you'll get some health. This, this is sort of, uh, just gives you an idea of like the horizon so you can get an idea of where you're sort of angled, the attitude of the aircraft, um, as well as the airspeed, ground speed, your altitude, um, all important things. And then we also want some video coming back as well. So the, this is sort of how we did this sort of, we, we broke it down into three parts. Um, we start with the ground control. We have, you know, our, our ground control software. Um, it goes to our telemetry receiver. Um, we have uh, our FD, F, FPV display, which is first person view. Um, and that's through our, our video receiver, which these are all very conventional. And then in our relay system, we have, uh, we're changing the frequency. So like our our, our forward commands are being changed into 433, and then our our video is being changed to 900, um, and also our telemetry is, is in 433 as well. Uh, we've had some issues with um, interference, um, but in general, that's how we try to carry that sort of design out. And because we have these sort of nice legalities, we actually couldn't fly in our, our design. So what we did was we hooked up a remote control car with all the, the amenities. Um, 
and then we got up onto the building of SE2, and we sh we basically shot down and used a um, an attenuator. We attached it to the the receiver, so that way the signal, um, the attenuator power gets reduced. Um, so we used a 30 dB and a 10 dB attenuator, and it, it's supposed to simulate longer distances. But kind of what we found was that. Um, as we went out farther, we actually had a shallower angle with the ground, and you start seeing these multi-pathing effects. So there was a point where we got, you know, about a mile out with with this um, everything attenuated and, and on a 30 dB load, and we started the signal just went completely to crap, and we couldn't quite figure out why. And a lot of it could be from this multi-pathing. So. Um, so it's, it's not a good way to simulate flying, in other words. Um, but I'd like to point out, too, that this is kind of what you would see. So if we were flying an aircraft, uh, you would have this, this uh, what they call like on-screen display. And it has all the information like we've shown uh, here. And that way, the, the, whoever's flying the aircraft, you'll have, of course, you'll have a visual observer. Um, to remain legal would, would be able to see that and they can see all the health of the aircraft real time. Uh, so this is sort of a synapse of what we did. Uh, tried to estimate the receiver sensitivity because none of that stuff was documented in the equipment we we're using. Um, and then this is one of the sites we were able to actually control from, which is 2.3 miles with the 10 dB attenuation. Uh, and then the school is way over there, so we're somewhere way back there. So with this system, we estimate that we can maybe do 30 miles. So how much time do we got? A little over an hour. A little over an hour. Okay, so I talked about earlier the little handheld sensor. Uh, so this is what we more or less did, so we put this on a, a quad rotor to detect the methane. Um, it's more of like a, um, it's, a, it's still a work in progress, a lot of research is going into this um, on how to sort of search and localize leaks using this technology. Um, but it, what happened? Is that held on by zip ties to the uh I think some of the the cables are, are tied down with zip ties. It's not pretty. It's it's effective. It's not a. It's not for elegance. It's not like we're marketing this thing. Um, some of the other sort of uh, ideas with this long range system that we want to implement is. Uh, more fixed wing testing. We want to try and create diversity systems so we can have 4G and our communication system. Uh, and then we also want to do, uh, for this sort of swor uh, source seeking, we want to have basically ways to do cognitive, what we're calling cognitive sensing. So we want to be able to detect and then uh, have the aircraft kind of think and methodically sort of search out uh, the source. But yeah, very much ongoing projects. Do you guys have any questions on that stuff at the moment? So when you have drones flying over pipelines, do you have to have people in a truck following it around? So the idea is not to have that. So we want to ultimately have it so we can run autonomous operations. Uh, the FAA will not allow that right now. There is some research that's being done uh, on that, but it's still like, they're still trying to hash out how to be safe about everything. Because when you're flying that far, it's how's your system reliable? How can you prove it's reliable? What happens if you have you know A, B, or C happen to your system? And how do you sort of mitigate the risks, right? Uh, but in the, in the end game, that's kind of what we want to do, is we want to be able to send these things out and basically detect them autonomously or, or semi-autonomously with, with human input or human in the loop. Any others? 
So now onto UTM, Beyond Visual Line of Sight, and US warming. So there will be some overlap on the Beyond Visual Line of Sight stuff. Uh, so why UTM? What is UTM? So it stands for Unmanned Aerial System Traffic Management. I'm sure you guys know that from your test, right? <laughs> so, so the hobbyist level drones are basically, you know, a lot of this stuff is growing. A lot of people are getting more and more interested into it. Um, I like to think the FAA thinks that's what drone pilots are. Um, just crazy people with remote controls. But it, it's definitely growing in popularity. What happened? Oh, I hit the B. In case you ever get your presentation, B and W. So B is for a black screen, W is a white screen. So if you ever have to pause, you can you can pause it. Yep, so we talked a little bit about some of these. There's a bunch of commercial applications. This is why everything is sort of exploding. So a lot of people are trying to like deliver products with drones. Yeah, we've already talked about surveillance. Uh, news gathering, so a lot of these companies, they want to sort of use it for uh, documenting. Uh, we talked about disaster mapping, ag, um, spraying and seeding, that's another one. So like using autonomous drones to sort of uh, spray uh, crops, entertainment is a big one. A lot of people use it for, for video, putting nice phantom 4K sort of cameras on drones. Yeah, some more commercial applications. So we got more stuff. You have like micro drones, they can do a lot of cool stuff. Amazon Prime Air. Uh, this one is pretty uh, pretty cool. I'm spacing the name at the moment. I should have it. Uh, but this one actually does about 24 hours. It's a gas powered, it's a civil UAS uh, military grade. And then you have uh, other aircrafts like um, Topcon. Actually, I, have, no, I don't have notes on it. So, yeah, we have Dell Artec, Precision Hawk. This is Trimble, which is um, another one that's up and coming, Aggie Air. Um, this other one is a plane designed by a guy out of Colorado. Uh, and it's actually used in one of the NASA Beyond Visual Line of Sight um, demos. Uh, but it, I've been told it has about a three hour endurance. So it's, it's definitely one of the more precision. But we also see more enforcement grade stuff, right? So this is the Indigo, has about a 45 minute flight time. Uh, this is the Desert, uh, Desert Hawk. It has about two and a half hour flight time. It's another kind of semi-modular based drone, uh, different payloads. Behind it is the K-Max. This is also fully autonomous uh, with beyond visual line of sight capabilities. And then they have uh, the Sikorsky uh, Matrix, which is a sort of a passenger carrying plane or um, helicopter, but they've converted it to be fully autonomous. So this is an example of, one of what they were doing with this uh, the K-Maxes they're using actually to carry water. Um, and it has a, about a 6,000 pound uh, lifting capacity. Uh, so I have a video here to sort of showcase. This was a demo that uh, I was at for um, UTM. Um, and this was last year, uh, November. So where they, they demoed all these, these aircrafts, whoops. See if we got enough volume. Yeah, apparently, I, my volume doesn't work. But the idea is they use these teams, right? So they have an indigo that has thermal capabilities, so they can spot fires, and it communicates with the K-Max, and the K-Max will go and find a water source. It picks up the water, and then we can sort of fly this. And based on information it got from indigo, it can go ahead and drop. Um, water on the fire. 
I thought it was really cool and dandy and until I found out that that is manually triggered. I thought they actually like did all this autonomously. Everything else is autonomous except for like someone pulling the bucket. Um, so then you have the Sikorsky and the Desert Hawk combo. So the Desert Hawk will find people and the Sikorsky will be deployed out to go pick them up. Um, not sure how it works with like incapacitated people, but one of the very cool things I've seen with this Desert Hawk, which um, is called a, a deep, deep uh, stall, and that's how they landed it. So they went up really high and they actually stalled the plane. And they basically, at the last like, minute, they went flat and it basically allows it to just drop. And it doesn't damage the plane, but it's just interesting watching this thing like fall out of the sky be fine. Like normally we don't land the plane like that. Go to the next slide, no. All right, some drone statistics. So the number of drones shipped I think for the sake of time, I'll, I'll go through this kind of fast. Um, we have 700,000 drones shipped in 2015, 400,000 on Christmas, right? 63% uh, of the sales went up from 14 to 15. So these are old statistics, but you can kind of get an idea of how the trends are going. Uh, number registered, so there's a lot unregistered currently. Um, they estimated that the industry right now is 3.3, projected it up to like 90 billion. So if you guys are getting into sort of entrepreneurial stuff, which I think is part of also your, your project, you know, it's a good business to probably get into if you can sort of make yourself unique. Um, the number of incidents between a drone and a manned aircraft, 28. I find that to be still kind of high, still low, I guess, for the number of drones. Number of times basically the ATC or the pilot spotted drone in a fly path, was it's a lot higher. And I thought this one would be interesting. 616 times it had an encounter with a 50 plus passenger plane. I don't know if you've seen what a bird does to like those planes, but they can be like catastrophic. So if you send, you know, a little flying piece of metal like into one of those engines, I mean, I, I can imagine it can't be good, right? Yeah, so they're designed to be able to land and, and do stuff with only like one or two engines on. I think maybe even up to up to one. But everything has to be compensated and trimmed out. But I think it can be done. So there's another sort of thing showing the drone market sort of growing what they what they project. So a lot of it is military related, some of it's civil. Um, but there is this sort of upward trend. Um, so there's like a list of some key players, right? You have Parrot, 3D Robotics, however they're sort of dying. Um, you know, uh, DJI is another big player. So more, more graphs just showing trends, right? So the FAA, I guess, in 2020 estimates 7 million drones, right? So that's a lot. Um, a lot of them are hobbyists. Some will be commercial vehicles. But what does that really mean, right? So how does that affect the national airspace system or the NAS? Um, so I guess first we have to sort of look at what the national airspace system is. Um, have you guys, are you familiar with this at all? Or have you guys looked at this? I know you have and you probably. So essentially it's sort of a guideline um, and it, this isn't indicative of, of the airspace at all. Um, it's just showing you how the systems are in place. So class B or is more of your busy airports. Um, uh, they're shaped as like upside down cakes. So they have tiers. Um, and then class C is, um, is, not, is not as much busy airport, but, and then it goes down. So.
All right. So let's see. Um, yeah, it's hard to go like three hours, like slides back to back. And there's a lot of there's a lot of information on here, so I'm just as overwhelmed as you guys are. Um, yeah, so the idea for this is they want to sort of create the principles to sort of accelerate this beyond visual line of sight into class G. Uh, the transparency is so they can see what, what's going on between all the aircrafts. Um, they want to create the operating pr principles, so how these sort of things happen and the basic mantras, so like where the structures need to be uh, in terms of the system and and how to sort of their deal with the risks and performance requirements. So you have U.S. operators. So there's three sort of, so you have the operators, you have the service providers, and then you have the regulators. Um, the conceptual architecture is kind of shown. So this is, it's going to get uh, consecutively sort of more complex, I guess, and confusing, but the basic idea is that you have, you know, your UAS operators, which have multitude of UAS possibly, um, and they can communicate with the service provider. Um, the service provider has some constraints and stuff from the public, as well as public safety, so this is what we're talking about with the emergency stuff, um, how to deal with that. Uh, you have these other supplemental providers that deal with, let's say, weather, um, your performance requirements, et cetera. Um, and then you have some data services, and, and then they, they keep changing these, these names up a bit, but the idea is that they would all communicate, and you have the National Airspace and the Traffic Management System that ultimately okay flights. So similar to, I don't know if any of you guys have flown through, I know Jacob has, where we submit flight requests through our system, we have to be approved. In a similar fashion, that's kind of what would happen. So in their sort of larger structure, um, keeps it growing. So you, again, you have UAS, you have the, the client or the operator. Um, and then, or actually, sorry, the client is what communicates with the traffic management system. And then you have the operators. Uh, so they, again, they sort of have this, uh, this sort of setup where you have the service suppliers. They're getting information from the public and from, from uh, what do you call it, the public safety guys, uh, law enforcement, emergency personnel. Uh, but they're also keeping track of whether your performance, uh, your vehicle performance, weather, all that information. And they also store all your credentials. So if you're not certified for a certain aircraft, then you can't fly, right? This is an example case. So you have an operator um, submit some operation waypoints, vehicle info, goes into the system. Uh, then they, they check your UVIN, which is like your unmanned aerial system vehicle identification number. Um, that in turn will check and uh, see if you're registered in the system. It'll check your static constraints. So these are like temporary flight restrictions. So if presidents in the area, bummer, you can't fly. Um, and then it checks the dynamic constraints, right? So you have weather trajectories, I guess. Uh, what else is there? I think it checks all your model information. Um, it shares the information to UTM, so it allows everybody to see. So this would be the emergency personnel, the, the operators of UTM. Uh, and then if you have some sort of contingency, so like this is, the, I think, one of the best things about UTM is where if something happens, if you breach the system, they'll, they'll kind of know about it. If you have a loss of communication, how do you sort of mitigate that? And you can communicate that to other aircraft so they know what's going on. And then the emergency response stuff so they can tell people to move out of the way or you guys need to land for a second. We have an aircraft coming in. Uh, so there's a lot of information in that. Sort of hard to explain with the amount of time I got. Any questions on this one? These 
No. So they approached this in like three different levels. So they, they broke it down into four capabilities. Um, I'm going to sort of blast through this. Uh, so each, each capability sort of increasing the level of complexity and uncertainty. So like the first one, uh, they tested in a remote field or remote area. Um, very low risk environment. They tried to do their mobile applications, display things and notifications. The, the second one, they're basically extending the capability to do beyond visual line of sight or extended visual line of sight. Um, they increase some traffic density, so they add other aircrafts in the area and how sort of things communicate and handle. Um, they have four risk areas, so they, um, the number of people, the amount of property on the ground, number of manned aircraft in the area, density. The third one is um, these operations, right? So. Um, let me think here. I wrote myself some notes, but apparently they're not helpful notes. So I think for, for this capability, this is, this is relatively new territory because they didn't do testing on this stuff um, yet. So they only went up to the, uh, the TCL2. Uh, this one, however, they, they want to introduce more populated areas as well as in introduce uh, confliction so they have like flights cross path and how do you sort of deconflict the uh, the flight paths in an automated way and the last one is sort of to handle these large scale contingencies so you have a lot of aircraft in the area and you have to deal with emergency personnel going how to sort of deal with that um, and then what happens when the system goes down but they're, in each sort of TCL, they're gradually adding more and more complexity to the system. Uh, so here's sort of an idea. It gives you an idea of scalability, or what they're sort of talking about, is that you have, you know, when you first had cars, very open roads, you can kind of fly around wherever. And then you get these smaller cities forming, maybe a few more cars, and then all of a sudden you have, like, a whole bunch of cars on the road, traffic jams, chaos. So I feel like we're not so much on the first image, we're sort of in the city where we're getting more and more operators, but you want to build UTM before you get to this sort of chaos. So a lot of this stuff is very, Very repetitive, I think, for the amount of information as we sent. What did I do? Yeah, and no, I hit the black, the the button. There we go. Back. So beyond visual line of sight. <clears throat> I can take it back. So there's some new stuff on this. Um, so I, I decided to focus on a few areas of beyond visual line of sight, mainly GPS denied areas, um, ADSB, cloud-based systems we talked about with L Lattice and UTM, and then active sense and avoid systems. So uh, at this conference, uh, I ran into a company called Primal Space Systems, and they had a very unique way to try and to do GPS denied navigation. So the idea is to they created this JPEG technology, or JPEG, sorry, um, where they can get this information about the landscape. So once you have information about um, your surroundings, so say you map this environment, you can packetize this stuff up, and you can send it to your, your drone. Um, so it sends these encoded packages, it receives it, and then what it does is it, it opens up this sort of map, and it, it um, orients itself inside space, right? So for instance, a good application that you might see this in is, is say Mars, for instance. We don't have satellites on Mars, so we can't sort of do satellite navigation, and, and you have to deal with dead reckoning, so you'll have problems there. And this is, uh, there's actually a project called, 
Prandtl M, where they're trying to fly drones in the Mars atmosphere to get an idea of what uh, better understand sort of the atmosphere and, and what's going on there. So for that sort of application, you know, if you had this technology on there and you mapped Mars previously, you can use that to sort of navigate. Um, so it's a very unique way that they approach that. And then of course we have Lattice. Um, this is a different sort of image that kind of shows that what you might see on this screen where you'd have multiple aircrafts in the area so you kind of get an idea of what's going on around you. I call it more of a passive sense and avoid since it's not really active. It's not, you're just giving you information. We've seen this slide already. Um, and then you have more of an active sense and avoid. So this is something that I want to still work on, but uh, the sort of active research is, is combining sensors and using a, this sort of multimodal approach where you have uh, instruments like radar and you're using radar to detect, but you're also using computer vision to confirm. Uh, dealing with sensors and in robotics, you'll see that some of this stuff is very noisy, so your radar might go off, and then if your system is automated, you might deviate and say it's nothing, it's just a blip in your sensor. But however, if you have two different sensors communicating the same sort of uh, uh, confirmation, then you can say with some certainty that, yeah, this is a person or this is a bird, right? If we're flying, maybe you don't want to hit a small bird that's in the area or an aircraft, say, if you can detect it from that far. So this is um, <clears throat> so maybe I'll just finish up these really fast since we didn't take the second break and then we can just go like 10 early. Um, so this is the the recent sort of, I mentioned that they did T TCL2 um, for the UTM, so they tested this stuff in um, in Renosted Airport, and they mainly sort of showcased that they can fly different drones, all flying beyond visual line of sight, different altitudes to sort of mitigate wrecks, but that they, they were able to get information from UTM, um, and then they were also um, using different radar systems to understand where they were at and uh, and weather to get to give them sort of push notifications of what's going on. Uh, but you can see Precision Hawk was a part of this. There was a few other players. Um, so in building this slide deck, um, I was trying to find pictures of this plane because I couldn't really figure out who it was. But apparently this is on the um, Paws Association website. Um, and I found myself here, so I'm. So I was like, "Oh, that's pretty neat." But yeah, this this aircraft was also flown in this Reno Stead uh, experiment, but for the sort of more long distance or beyond visual line of sight. Some of the other stuff was done in the extended visual line of sight range. So here is sort of an outline of where they were testing. So they had multiple ground stations. Um, this blue line is an actual aircraft, so general aviation aircraft. Um, and then at the airport, they used this L-Star radar for the weather and, and also detecting um, the aircraft. Let's see if this. So these are some of the tests. I, I wasn't able to get like the, the main tests I was interested in showing for this, but um, they did showcase some tests where they're flying over water in between boats, uh, coming back. And they did a search and rescue sort of scenario, but uh, I think they were flying over a simulated sort of highway. the last segment right here. So swarming. So why is, I guess, what is swarming? What are some basic techniques? What do we, the future work with swarming, what does that look like? So we have two sort of pictures here. I mean, it, you gotta pick your preference, you know. 
you know, it's very op application dependent. So do you want to use quad rotor or do you want to use fixed wings? Um, so a lot of the swarming is, <clears throat> is also called multi-agent robotics, but it's, it's really um, derived from nature's sort of applications. So they take these bio-inspired sort of events and try and turn it into useful applications uh, and solve problems with it, essentially. So like you have fish and you have different birds that have this sort of swarming behavior. And there's a variety of things you can use this for, whether it is some sort of odor localization, so like methane detection, if you had multiple um, robots to do that, you can do that. Um, and this has been demonstrated before in the literature and stuff in ground-based robots as well. So you have two sort of two types um, of control strategies. You have what's called centralized and what and decentralized. And then you have control strategies um, or formation strategies. Sorry, where you have this sort of leader follower or this virtual structure approach. So for the first two, where you have uh, the centralized, so everything is commu communicating to the base station. So you have all this stuff that's, that's going on, but it's all controlled locally. Um, then you have a decentralized way where you're actually communicating to the, um, the, the drones or the agents, and then they're actually talking to each other as well. So they're, uh, there's no sort of center point where it gets its name from. And then you have, as far as structures go, you have this leader follower sort of setup. So maybe you send one drone, they all follow in line, or you do what's what, what they call a virtual structure. So they they all communicate with. This would be more of a decentralized approach where they're all communicating with each other, and they form maybe a geometric shape, or maybe they they have spacing associated with them. So then they can go ahead and use this, and this is a um, actually a useful pattern if you're dealing with sort of a gradient-based approach and in terms of like, say, if you want to find a, a source, like say methane is leaking, for instance, I'll go back to that example. Um, each one of these, if they're sensing it, they would get a different value. So if the source is over here, this might be high, this might be high, this might be low. So they can use a gradient-based approach to sort of um, localize where you couldn't do that if you're just a single sort of sensor. So there's a lot of caveats to that. And there's a variety of ways you can communicate, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, XB radios, cellular technology. Um, yeah, so this is just sort of a block diagram showing how you would communicate, um, like the, the process, I guess. So they'd re wait, receive information, you send information. Um, it creates sort of uh, tells everybody sort of where to position and then determines where to move and then they move. Uh, when these, This is more of a centralized approach and uh, you can sort of send information to them and then they might respond based on what they're uh, receiving in terms of from their sensor or um, from their environment. Uh, future work, so we already talked about some of this stuff. So this is an example. This is an example of maybe how you would use swarming in pipeline surveillance. So this is some distribution lines in Merced. So if we sort of focus on like a nice straight portion, we can zoom in and say we have a leak. I have some nice graphics here. So you, so um, it's on some some part of the the city. So one way you could probably do this is you can use a combination of these approaches. And I send them in sort of a virtual body and go ahead and, and, and fly along this pipeline. And in this red circle is sort of maybe a sensing area. Maybe that's where you can, you can pick up on the methane, right? So when the drones sort of pick up on it and say one of them senses it, they talk to the other one and say, okay, let's, one does like a loop one way and one does a loop the other way. And by doing this, you can sort of indicate which side or which way is the leak is going or if it's downwind. But you can probably communicate and say, okay, the leak is somewhere over here on this side of it. Um, 
it's not as straightforward as this because we have diffusion and things like that. So if you have an underground leak, it might diffuse and end up 20 feet uh, down to the side. It popped up through some grass or gravel or depending, I guess, if there's sidewalks and other obstructions. But the idea is that you can use a combination of these guys to try and localize. The last thing I have for you is this is a Intel's 500. So I was trying to find the original video, but it's about about two minutes long, and it talks about one of the applications they're trying to do in swarming that's not so much related to science. Has anybody seen this at all? Oh, was it? Just a video because FAA basically put a no fly zone over the area. Yeah, so they're trying to battle that, but I think they've done this in, in other countries. They did this with 100, and I thought that one was, it was a pretty cool video, but they took it down. A lot of sports teams have no fly zones. We check the sectional maps and stuff. Pop up a circle there. Yeah. So they created a pretty unique little platform just for displaying lights. So are they using a centralized or decentralized approach? My guess is maybe a combination, I'd imagine, so. I think they mentioned in here that they they can control this with one person. But yeah, so as an example of other swarming that I mean, I think it, in my opinion, I think it uses a combination of both centralized and decentralized to get an idea of where the spacing is. Because uh, you have wind and other effectors that sort of drift you into the other aircraft. Isn't there a current FAA rule that this allows somebody to operate multiple drones at once, though? Yeah. But I don't think they're operating in the U.S. The U.S. does. They have all these rules and regulations, but it doesn't apply to other countries because <laughs> there's... I think I gave earlier an example of France, right? France, they have the ability to do beyond visual line of sight. Where right now, we're still sort of battling with the idea and, and how to get the legal sort of stuff to work. So you got out of 20, 20 early. So did you, did you guys get all these, get all the quiz questions?